the OCR A-level English Literature Shakespeare examination is fast approaching. In this video, I'm going to look again at measure for measure. I'm going to take four past questions for the essay, so the section B, and I'm going to give you four critical references and references to different productions that you could potentially weave and integrate within your essay. I'm also going to show you a paragraph so that, you, so that you can see how these references to other productions or critical viewpoints can be integrated naturally and seamlessly within your essays. It's going to be incredibly useful, so stay tuned. You're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Olha, o gramático é tão também. É, pai, eu não gosto de ser, dá para não ser mordido, Não vês que sou eu. Oh, eu não vês que sou eu. Se você gostaria de uma exploração detalhada do Mark Scheme, I would suggest watching my video entitled Achieving an A Star in A Level OCR Measure for Measure Question B. However, essentially it is 50% for how well your essay is written, focused on the question and your excellent understanding of the text, and 50% for how well you integrate references to other productions and critical viewpoints. One past exam question was, the women in the play are dominated by the men. Show how far you agree with this view of the female characters in Measure for Measure. So you need to include references to different interpretations. Here are some for you. Here's the 2015 production of the play filmed at the Globe. It is Act 3, Scene 1, and Isabella has just launched the most scathing attack on her brother for daring to hint that just maybe she might go ahead and sleep with Angelo to save his life. Within any production, Isabella will dominate the later stages of her exchange with her brother, with attacks of astonishing vituperation, including the demand that he should die, perish. However, within this production, note how Claudio is physically manhandling his sister and has hold of her wrists as he physically tries to get her to see sense. Similarly here, Isabel might be crying fie, 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 but it is Claudio who is the stronger physically and who is attempting to exert his authority by keeping hold of his sister's wrists. In relation to the question, on the one hand, Shakespeare shows us how women, in this case Isabella, are prepared to state unpleasant, stark truths, which can be disturbing for men and audience members to hear. However, the 2015 Glow production shows us how men, here Claudio, may not be prepared to passively accept such statements and may try to use their greater strength in a bid to regain power and control. Now for another moment from that 2015 production. Let me explain the context carefully. It is later in Act 3, Scene 1, and the Duke has just explained his extraordinary plan, which will save the day for poor, besieged, beleaguered Isabella. She should agree to Angelo's disgusting, indecent proposal, but send Angelo's former fiance, Mariana, there in her place. In this production, the relieved Isabella gives the Duke and Friar a big hug to say thank you for coming up with such a good plan. However, the Duke holds on for slightly too long, as seen here. He still has her arms around Isabella's waist, whilst her arms have fallen down by her side. The Globe audience laugh at this, but nonetheless this gives an early insight into the Duke's desires for a trapped woman who, after all, has had intended a life of celibacy as a nun. This production makes it even clearer than the original text that the Duke has lustful feelings towards Isabella and may be unscrupulous enough to take advantage of his position as the highest authority in Vienna to ensure that they are satisfied. For my next critical view interpretation, we jump to Act 5, Scene 1, and the moment when Isabella yields to Mariana's entreaties and pleads for Angelo's life. 
According to this critic, Paul Edmonton, Isabel's lines here are tremendously affirmative. Even though she still thinks that Angelo has caused her brother's death, she is prepared to publicly forgive him in order presumably partly to show solidarity with her fellow woman, Mariana. In doing so, she is moving the spotlight away from the Duke as the all-powerful ruler and disrupting his plans to pardon Angelo only once it has been revealed that Claudio is alive. With this interpretation, we see a woman refusing to be dominated by powerful men and being prepared to stick up for her principles and other women in spite of the humiliation and anguish she must be feeling at this point in the play. Many modern productions choose to explore interesting gender issues by changing the sex of one or more of the characters. Famous examples include Helen Mirren as Prospera in a 2010 version of The Tempest and Maxine Peake as Hamlet in 2015. In Blanche McIntyre's 2021 production at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse, the Duke was played by a female actor, Hattie Ladbury, and so was Pompey. Eloise Secker. It becomes much harder to agree with the concept of women being dominated by men in the play if the Duke is played by a woman, giving his or her overwhelming control over the events of all five acts, either open or behind the scenes. Meanwhile, in this production, the female Pompey mingled amongst the audience prior to the start, offering out faux prostitute calling cards to unsuspecting spectators. This act drew the audience into the seedy world of Vienna, implied that both men and women were entirely comfortable with the sexual licentiousness of the city, and the audience should be too. What might a paragraph answering this question look like? I wrote, there is no doubt that a number of men in the play try to dominate or at least assert control over Isabella with varying levels of success. Angelo tries to blackmail her into sleeping with him. Claudio tries to guilt trip her into agreeing to the former's plan. And the Duke may or may not be successful with his final scene marriage proposal. However, none of the three men are definitively successful in their aims. And to some extent, this is due to Isabella's remarkable strength of character and commanding use of language. Hectoring phrases to Claudio such as, O oh, faithless coward, O oh, dishonest wretch, and a declaration to Angelo that she will tell the world aloud what man thou art, show Isabella's spirit and determination to retain her integrity and her desire not to be dominated by the men. However, within a patriarchal, lecherous, sex mad world such as Vienna, this is very difficult something reiterated in the 2015 Globe production when Claudio elected to hold Isabella's wrists and shake them vigorously in his doomed attempt to get her to consider sleeping with Angelo to save his life. The implication here is that if language and position doesn't first succeed, then men may resort to using their superior physical strength in order to dominate their female counterparts. If watching this in the classroom, you may like to press pause now to discuss how this meets the requirements of the mark scheme. Another past exam question was, Shakespeare never forgets the funny side to life in Vienna. Show how far you agree with this view. You need to include references to different interpretations. So here are some for you. Let's return to the 2015 Globe production and the way Elbow in Act 3, Scene 2 hurtles across the stage prior to delivering his first line of the scene. Nay, if there be no remedy for it. He does not one but two forward rolls to get across to Pompey. The effect of this ludicrous horseplay is to make it abundantly clear that this is a comic scene and that actually no one in Vienna is particularly bothered about maintaining law and order or stopping those who buy and sell men and women like beasts, including Elbow himself, who is ostensibly the constable 
and who's, so, whose primary role should be to bring those who commit offences to justice. This is confirmed shortly after in the scene when Elbow puts his arm across to restrain Pompey and accidentally finds his hand up against Pompey's crotch. Of course, it stays there slightly too long so that those in the globe and watching at home can see it and laugh accordingly. The Duke come friar has just issued for Pompey to be taken to prison, but Elbow is keen for him to be brought before Angelo, given the latter's known intolerance and hatred for whoremasters. He must before the deputy, sir. However, the effect of this hand positioning is unwittingly to provoke humour and to draw attention to a part of the body which appears to be out of control and given boundless licence within Vienna. The Duke has previously spoken earnestly enough about just how disgusting vice and indulging in vice can be. However, Elbow's silly malapropisms and general incompetence ensure that this rarely becomes too serious or overbearing, and in this production, his unconscious manhood touching further adds to the general amusement. More on Elbow now, this time from Blanche McIntyre's 2021 production at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse. He occasionally bellows using a megaphone, randomly switches on his siren from time to time, and also speaks via walkie-talkie for no apparent reason. The effect is similar to that of the forward rolls and the accidental crotch touching in the 2015 Globe production, it's impossible to take what Elbow says and does too seriously and ensures that, following the intensity of Angelo's blackmailing offer to Isabella in Act 2, Scene 4, that we can recall a more relaxed, funnier side to the cesspit that is Shakespeare's Vienna. With this question, you might like to bring in recalcitrant prisoner Barnardine. On stage, someone perpetually drunk is likely to provide amusement to an audience with their swaying, stammering and potential gagging. Although, of course, the Barnardine presented in David Thacker's 1994 production is a much darker figure. Within this famous quotation, Harold Bloom draws attention to Barnardine's wisdom in remaining permanently drunk, because to be sober in this mad play is to be madder than the maddest. Moments that make this play mad must include the Duke's startling proposal of marriage in the final act to a heroine whom Bloom describes amusingly as apocalyptically chaste, the bed swap plot, the substitution of skulls, and the fact that the one man condemned to death by Angelo, Claudio, appears to be one of the few faithful, sexually honourable men in the entire play. But actually, I wonder whether we enjoy Barnardine not just because of his drunkenness, but because he is one of the very few characters who refuse to go along with the Duke's endless, complicated machinations. The Duke may be able to fool those on stage that he is a friar. He may be able to convince Claudio that he should be ready to die. He may be able to toy with Isabella and Mariana in a number of different ways. But Barnardine simply will not play ball. And this recalcitrance is both a relief to the audience, what is enjoyable about watching someone wield absolute power, and something which makes us smile. What might a paragraph answering this question look like? I wrote, The idea that Shakespeare never forgets the funny side to life in Vienna can initially seem rather odd within a play in which the most memorable scenes must surely be those in which Angelo starts to become mesmerised by Isabella before eventually revealing his foul desires, and those two moments in the final act when the Duke extraordinarily proposes to Isabella. However, there are so many comic moments, particularly those involving Elbow. Just like his fellow Constable Dogbury in Much Ado About Nothing, his mangling of language, i.e. using benefactors for malefactors or respected for suspected, provokes hilarity on stage, so much so that on one occasion even the generally straight-laced Aeschylus cannot resist a joke at his expense. If he took you a box on the ear, you might have your action of slander too. Nonetheless, 
It's important to stress his role is ostensibly to ensure benefactors are brought to justice. And Vienna is clearly a city jam-packed with such types. The fact that he is clearly such a bumbling buffoon, something confirmed in Blanche McIntyre's 2021 production by his silly use of megaphone, walkie-talkie and siren, confirms categorically that ensuring justice prevails may be far less important to those in Vienna than enjoying life and being able to see its funny side. As before, if watching this in the classroom, you might like to press pause now to discuss how this meets the requirements of the mark scheme, or indeed how you might develop the argument further or differently, or what direction you might take within the essay as a whole. Another past exam question was a play about the difficult relationship between justice and mercy. How far do you agree with this? You need to include references to different interpretations. So here are some for you. Here's a still from the 2006 film of the play directed by Bob Comar. It is Claudio in prison. And this is what Isabella sees when she visits him there in Act 3, Scene 1. It's clear that Claudio has been beaten up and indeed the viewers witness this, although Isabella herself doesn't. The, the implication here is that this Vienna is a brutal world in which fair justice may be harder to come by. In the text, Isabella famously becomes enraged by Claudio's very faint hints and after more explicit suggestion that she might elect to agree to Angelo's proposal in order to save his life. And in this film version, Isabella's words seem all the harsher, all the more inhumane Given that Claudio has blood seeping out of his nose and ear, his eyes are bloodshot and his face is covered with bruises. Should his appearance not prompt greater kindness and empathy, if not necessarily mercy, from our supposedly Christian nun? And does the fact that she is unable to do this reveal something unsavoury, something unsettling about her own character, notwithstanding the actress Juliet Stevenson's description of her as the most courageous character in the play. It is clear that the Globe 2015 production is not particularly interested in either justice or mercy, or at least treating them particularly seriously. In Act 3, Scene 2, Elbow cries mock indignantly that Pompey hath offended the law, However, immediately afterwards, he himself cries, ooh, in quite a camp over the top way, thus implying that he doesn't actually care one jot about the offence and is merely going through the motions with a view towards quite enjoying himself in the process. Might there be an argument that the play is not about mercy and forgiveness, but rather power and exploitation? Essentially, the Duke superficially delegates power only to give him an opportunity to creepily snoop on everyone, seek reassurances about his dukely persona, which he doesn't always get, notably with Lucio, before returning as the all-singing, all-conquering hero to save the day. With this viewpoint, the play is not about the difficult relationship between justice and mercy, but about the problematic nature of an individual holding apparently unlimited power, which can be used in fairly random seeming indiscriminate ways to dispense what some, but not many, might call justice. The Duke's initial plan, presumably, was that by spying on everyone, and benignly watching Angelo from within the system, justice would be restored to Vienna. Angelo would clean up the widespread vice in a fair, systematic way, and then the Duke would be able to return to rule over a suitably cleansed, more morally acceptable society. However, Angelo's irresistible attraction and subsequent blackmailing offer to Isabella changes all of that, and means that the Duke has to return to deliver a fairly conventional renaissance display of justice and mercy. In the final scene, he himself has to declare who should be punished, who should be spared, and this is because his initial plan has fallen through. Although he did have some initial doubts about Angelo at the end of Act 1, Scene 3, when he wondered 
where the power might change purpose, what our C must be. The fact that ultimately he offers the same levels of mercy to a murderer, Barnardine, a fornicator, Claudio, and a power abuser, Angelo, taking apart the requirement for two of those to marry, seems to suggest that he continues to have little interest in the intricacies of justice and mercy, provided he can continue to be fawned upon and make no mistake. His behaviour in Act 5, Scene 1 confirms that his claim that he doesn't like to stage himself to the people is nonsense, and provided he can finally bed that nun, he will be content. What might a paragraph answering this question look like? I wrote, The suggestion that measure is a play about the difficult relationship between justice and mercy seems to presuppose that the rulers in Vienna take law maintaining and law breaking seriously and want to ensure that there is fairness as well as compassion when dealing with offenders. However, early on there are signs that actually this may not be the case. Firstly, there is the Duke's own recognition to the friar early on that he is allowed liberty to pluck justice by the nose and has essentially let offenders off scot-free. Secondly, there is the fact that even cold fish Angelo finds himself prioritising his own sexual desires ahead of justice when he demands that Isabella yields up her body to his will. And then there is the strange final act in which all offenders, from murderer to fornicator to power abuser, are pardoned, provided, of course, they agree to marry a woman who loves them. The Duke's somewhat arbitrary dispensing of justice it seems to be Lucio who angers him most, even though his crimes are surely far less significant than those committed by Barnardine. Seems to imply that the play may not be about getting the balance right between punishment and forgiveness, but, as suggested by Edmerson, power and exploitation. So if you are watching this in the classroom, you might like to press pause now to discuss how this meets the requirements of the mark scheme, or indeed how you could develop this argument further, how you could take a different argument, or what direction you might take across the essay as a whole. Another past exam question was a play in which power is invariably misused. How far do you agree with this view? You need to include references to different interpretations. So here are some for you. In the 2006 film version of the play, it's notable that the Duke doesn't ask the proverse in Act 3, Scene 1 to be concealed so he can eavesdrop on Isabella and Claudio. Instead, he rings Claudio, who, when Isabella enters, leaves the telephone off the hook. The Duke and Friar stays on the line and hears the entire increasingly disturbing exchange between the siblings. Now, when we think of the question, there is certainly an argument that the Duke is abusing his power by disguising his identity and wandering around Vienna as a fake friar. However, in this production, at least, Claudio is either unintentionally or intentionally complicit in terms of willingly allowing his deeply personal conversation with Isabella to be overheard. In this production, Claudio has a degree of agency not present in the original text. And with this moment, at least, the Duke has not actively had to engineer a situation in order to secretly gather more information and power. That said, in this production, the Duke offers precious little comfort to Claudio following Isabella's tirade. After she has left the cell, Claudio picks up the phone and starts to speak, Most Holy Father. How does the Duke come fry respond? He simply hangs up. The 2006 film also elects to show flashbacks of Angelo and Mariana years previously when they were a happy couple. Whilst the Duke is explaining the background to his extraordinarily elaborate plan, i.e. that once upon a time Mariana should this Angelo have married. This subtly affects the way we view the Duke and his relationship with power. Within the text and a faithful stage production, this reference to Mariana and Angelo comes as a strange bolt out of the blue. We've heard absolutely nothing about this Angelo before 
and have probably assumed that until being entranced by Isabella that he had no sexual or romantic yearnings whatsoever hence his own description of the austereness of his life in Act 2, Scene 4, which Isabella clearly recognises as reasonably accurate. Without a flashback, it all sounds improbable and shows the Duke wielding an uncomfortable amount of power in relation to two young, vulnerable women who would need to rely on his account absolutely. But here, with the flashback, um, the emphasis is less on a megalomaniac duke and far more on both Mariana and Angelo. We see Mariana looking happy and loved up and Angelo similarly relaxed. And so when we learn that Angelo ditched his fiance following the loss of her dowry at sea, and we see this happening within the film, our hearts go out to poor Mariana and feel pleased that she might have a chance of being happy once again. With this moment in the film, the use of flashbacks suggests that actually the Duke Cum Friar is using his power and prior knowledge to excellent, kind effect. The critic Wilson Knight would certainly not have agreed that Measure was a play in which power was invariably misused. For him, the Duke is a benign, paternalistic figure. How else should we describe someone who cares enough about cleaning up a city that he puts his renowned stricter deputy in charge, who ensures Mariana is returned to her rightful husband, who delivers justice in the final act, and who gives an otherwise obscure loner woman the chance of a fabulous transformation in social position and fortunes? Harold Bloom would disagree, of course, and agrees with Lucio. The Duke most certainly abuses his power and gets a kick out of weird stunts. Does Isabella really deserve to be tormented and toyed with about the death of Claudio when the Duke knows full well he is alive? Does he really need to take Claudio down the darkest alleys when acting as a friar to prepare him for death? Are comments such as, happy thou art not, friend thou hast none, and thou, art, thou hast not youth nor age really needed or necessary? Here's how a paragraph answering this question might look like. There is no doubt that the Duke wields an inordinate amount of power in the play, something modern audiences in particular are likely to be uncomfortable with. When disguised as a friar, he eavesdrops shamelessly on Claudio and Isabella. When returned triumphantly to power in Act 5, he seems to prioritise getting petty revenge on slanderous Lucio and manipulating events so that he can be seen as the saviour of all, ahead of dispensing fair, rational justice. However, this viewpoint fails to take account of all the good the Duke does with his power. For instance, he is able to respond quickly and sensitively to Isabella's dilemma by recalling the past relationship between Mariana and Angelo and how this might end up both saving Isabella's chastity but restoring Mariana to happiness and fulfilment as a bride. The idea of the Duke using his power as a force for good is emphasised in the 2006 film version of the play by flashbacks. As the Duke tells Isabella Mariana's tragic story, the viewer is shown shots from an imagined past of a younger Mariana and Angelo walking happily together as a couple. These flashbacks make it clear that this relationship did happen. This relationship was serious and loving. This device means that there is no need to be cynical and distrustful of the Duke, who can unquestionably at times come across as fantastical. We can relax knowing that here, at least, the Duke is using his power for magnificently benign effect. So if you're watching this with a group, you may like to pause now to discuss how this relates to the Marx scheme, your thoughts on the arguments and how you might develop this argument further. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production helping you integrate critical views and interpretations for your A-level Measure for Measure essay. Many thanks for watching.